Um, first of all, thank you for all the, it was a 24 years of, yeah. of your work on the series, <laughs> making us laugh. It's a pretty thank incredible. Thank you, thank you for laughing. <laughs> I mean, it's hard not to. There's one of the most, uh, I mean, joke for joke, it's, it's endlessly funny. It takes you places you don't expect it to go. And then when it gets there, you're like, should we be here? And then it still makes you laugh when you're uh, uncomfortable. It's exactly what comedy should be. It should mm -hmm. be a surprise and it should be a little a little bit disconcerting, you know? Because otherwise, you know, why? why? Otherwise we could be mimes or jugglers or clowns or something. To be a little bit, you know, comedy should always make you a little slightly bit uncomfortable. And Curb Your Enthusiasm does that perfectly. <laughs> so how did you get involved all those years back? Well, you know, I knew Larry from way back in our club days in, in, in New York in, in the 80s. In 19, I must have met him 1985, 86, the Catch a Rising Star. And then he split. He went to L.A. to do Seinfeld, as we know. And I didn't see him. I hadn't seen him for years. And one day I got a phone call. And it was just, Susie, it's L.D. Like, oh, what are you calling about? You know, well, after all these years, and he offered me the part. And I was like, well, what, what is it? What's the, uh, what's the part? Don't worry about it. You could do it. I said, well, send me a script. There's no script. There's no money. You know, I mean, it was like the lowest budget operation you could imagine. And I was a day player in the beginning, the first two seasons. And, uh, but, you know, I loved Larry. I knew he was a genius. And I figured I've got nothing to lose. Never in my wildest dreams. Did I think I would be here 24 years later talking about this show? It's, you know, I, I'd love to get one of those calls, especially from Larry David. That'd be, uh... Just, you never know what's going to happen in life. I never thought, I mean, I was a comic, so I knew my, my life would be about making people laugh, but I never thought my life would end up that I would be famous and beloved for cursing at people. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in my plan, but you know, you just go where life takes you, I guess. I'm not sure if that's in many people's plans, but it worked, it worked out well out. for me. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, who would have thought that that I could just show up and, you know, tell everybody to go fuck themselves and then they pay <laughs> me and I go home and then I come back the next day and do it all over again. It's, I, it, look, it's a little more than that. You know, I, don't, I don't like to make it seem like that's all I'm doing, but it's what I'm known for, I guess. Well, can we get into that a little bit? Because everybody watches the show and everybody's like, wait a second, how does this work? And people try to explain it. And I think some people are close, but I don't, I'm, I'm always curious, like where, what it began with. And like, especially now you're, or was it uh, you know, over 10 seasons in? 12, 12. 12 seasons. So <laughs> you, you have, uh, I'm sure it evolved a little bit, especially when you kind of like these characters start to build. So how did that begin? And, and how did it end up like with the, the, the improv did. and. Yeah, the own. process didn't really evolve that much. The process was pretty much the same from day one. What changed was the characters grew, the relationships grew. The the um, we don't have a, a script. We have an outline. Uh, Larry, you know, Larry's brain is all about story, and anybody who's watched the show knows how how important the story is and how it's a big puzzle that he puts together in this callback after callback after callback and. You know, everything kind of pulls together in the end, but nothing happens more or less just for the purpose of being funny without it having meaning in the story, without moving the story forward. I always see my role as the story driver. You know, different people have different roles. Um, he uses me a lot to drive story. Um, not consciously, it's just how it, it kind of evolved. We've never, we've never sat down and talked about it. You know, what's my character? What's our relationship? It just, we just kind of un have like a dialogue of the unconscious where we understand one another. And I always know what he wants. And uh, I always know how to surprise him, which is one of the greatest joys of my job. And we just, we just play. It's just play, you know? We just know what the scene, we know what has to happen in the scene, but there's no dialogue written. And so when something like pretty good comes up, if that was improvised the first time, then does that get written in or is that still just become like, is it, is it you know, like both. how much it would direction be, do you have? It, it would be both. Um, sometimes there's a line that's written because the, there's an, a, a line that's necessary for story. Like you have to say X, Y, Z because mm -hmm. it's a necessary part of the storyline. Um, but something like, you know, we all have our catchphrases. Larry's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Mine is you fat fuck. 
you know, whatever it is. Uh, I, those are not written into the outline. Those are our choices in the moment. You know, so much of what we do is just a choice in the moment to do that particular thing. And we're given incredible, one of the reasons why I love this job so much is because I don't know any other show where I would have so much creative input into what happens on camera because it's all my choice, what I say. And every now and then, you know, um, I'll get direction on it from either Jeff Schaefer or Larry, which is don't say that, or maybe, maybe go in this direction, but usually not. Usually we just roll with whatever he, his whole thing is casting the right people and letting them do what they do. So when you're surrounded with these funny people, is it a lot of pressure? Like you, like, do you feel like you have to keep up or no? No, because one of the keys to improvising is not thinking about being funny. That's the kiss of death. You have to think about who your character is, what your relationships are, and what what your intention is in the scene. So because I'm working with geniuses like Jeff Schaefer and Larry David, I don't have to think about being funny. I know that it's a true situation comedy in the truest sense of the word because there's no jokes written. It's all situation. So I know if they set the situation up, I just play the situation and don't think about being funny. I just play the intent of the scene, which is for me as a comic, as a comedic actress, it's so freeing to not have to even think about, oh, oh, this is going to be funny. I'm going to say this line and it's going to be clever and witty. Never think about that at all. Just listen, talk, be in the scene, be in the moment. And how much of Susie Green is Susie Espen? You know. <laughs> well, you know, we're very, very different. I never wanted to play myself. I live with myself 24 seven. I don't need to be myself on camera. So I, I kind of came up with this care and again, was given complete leeway within parameters of that she has a filthy mouth and a temper to create who she was. Besides that Larry wanted me to, you know, be like angry and cursing Jeff and him. Besides that, I had complete leeway to create who this person was including how she dresses. <laughs> um, so I wanted to play this character that is completely sure of herself in every way, that has no zero self-awareness. I'm a comic. All I have is questioning and self-awareness and overanalyzing huh. everything and insecurity and all that. So I wanted to play the opposite of that, of this character who is just completely sure of every, that everything she does and says is right. And that she wears the most gorgeous clothes and has the greatest case and that everybody is wrong except her. And and zero, zero self-awareness about who she actually is. And where does it security self-security come from? From like Susie? Drives it? Yes. You know, I think it's just how she was brought up. I think she was very loved as a child and just told that she was the greatest, greatest, greatest all the time, as opposed to me, how I was brought up. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just, not bright. She's very bright. She's very cagey and very smart. And as as we see, they can't pull the wool over her eyes. She's up, you know, she knows everything that they're doing. But she's not an intellectual. I'm much more of an intellectual. <laughs> you know, so she's she's simple in her in her likes and dislikes. Yet if she likes you and she loves you, she's fiercely loyal. I mean, look how she is with Sammy, her daughter. She will protect her to to the she's even loyal to Larry in many ways, you know? I mean, she mm -hmm. slept all the way to Atlanta to support him begrudgingly, but she still goes, you know? So she's, she's very loyal. And so she's, she's kind of simple in, in, her, in her ethic, but, but very, I think she's actually the moral compass of the show in many ways. Yeah, she, you know, it, it may not seem that way, but she's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing that surprised me with all the characters is what the insight they give into different aspects of, of life today and, and society, because you don't always agree. I mean, there's not, many times you don't agree with any of them, but uh, when you do see things their way, it's uh, it comes from different angles. It comes from, you know, from JB, right. from, and, from and, you. From... And everybody in life sees the, the world through their own, you know, prism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so these characters do as well. Like JB is a perfect example. You know, he's not Leon. Leon has a very particular thought process going on that he clicks into and just, you know, goes, but so does Susie. You know, they're very different characters than who we are in real life. And they're very specific in, in that characterization. But what's interesting about talking about the, the moral, 
at the ethics of it is that when you look at the show, not always, but most of the time, Larry is right in what he's doing. It's like he goes about it completely wrong. <laughs> you know, he does not have any bedside manner. He does, but so often he's correct in, in what he's saying. Yeah, he, he says a lot of the things that people don't say out loud. You just think That's it right. and wh whisper it later. That's right. Like in, in that way, I feel like he's acting out people's fantasies. And I feel like Susie is doing that also, especially for women, that she's acting out their anger. She's allowing women to like, you know, because as women were brought up, you know, be nice little girls and anger mm -hmm. isn't pretty and all that kind of crap that I was brought up with. Then I think Susie taps into that. I know because so many women t stop me on the street, tell me I've given them permission to be rageful. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone needs to be hurt. Happy, right. happy, angry or sad, whatever it is, it shouldn't be... Uh shouldn't be hiding that part of ourselves, so. Which we all do. Yes, yeah, unfortunately, that's the case. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm raising two daughters and I want them to be, I told them, don't don't sit back and, and let people, you know, kind of control the conversation or the mood of, or whatever it is. That's right. Put, put, your, you put your voice out there, yeah. And, I and was not a... brought up that way, Stephen. I, was, I remember my father telling me, when you're out with boys, don't talk too much. You're too opinionated. Let them have the opinions. Are you kidding me? No. My daughters don't let me have my opinions anymore. There it's you go. Like, <laughs> well, they're a the team up on me. Like, Come on, you're crying out loud. Yeah. They're a different to... generation, and they have yeah. a good father who encourages them. I didn't well, have that. <laughs> well, that's, I, I try my best. So uh, was the Kafkan your first billboard ever? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so now that, you know the story with that, that after the show premiered, they put they put the the billboard up on Santa Monica Boulevard, mm -hmm. and that it was in real life defaced in the same way that it was yes, on the show. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Was it was your first billboard with penises drawn? Uh, my first billboard it. with or without penises drawn. Wow. But, you know, it's funny because somebody said to, to me, check off two boxes. Exactly. <laughs> somebody asked me, "Did that bother you?" I said, "No, I thought it was hilarious." <laughs> we kind of knew it was going to happen. But it was no easy feat because it was like way up high, mm -hmm. these billboards on Santa Monica. People had to get up with like scaffolding and ropes tied around them. And it wasn't like just spray painting on the side of a building. I mean, it was an effort to get up there and draw those penises. And they did a beautiful job. <laughs> Whoever does the graffiti in this world, you know, getting up there, finding a way in a billboard, you know, and, and delivering it, you know, and, but also walking away safely they they should be hired by companies to, to i don't know what to do but they're it's and amazing the places you see the the the, 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 uh, the spray painting the, the artistic part the, too yeah exactly a lot of graffiti is really amazing but mm -hmm. i i get a text from larry one morning and he just wrote it happened you know and i i thought for a second and then i realized what he was talking about somebody defaced <laughs> how long did that last did they keep it up or was it um, they kept it up for a little bit and then they took it down. But I had so many friends send me pictures of them standing <laughs> in front of it. It became like a like a, a, a tourist destination spot. <laughs> yeah, your, your phone must have been blowing up that day. It was fun. It was really fun. Yeah, That's the I mean, whole thing about this show. You know, it's like every season I get the outlines and it's like, I never know, what am I doing this? Is, okay, I guess this season I'm having penises drawn in my mouth. You know, <laughs> it's just like, okay, whatever, I'll go with it. <laughs> It's truly life imitates art in, you know, in art imitating life, not only with the, with the billboard, but with uh, a lot of what goes on, you know, like it really digs into the things that are going on in the world. And sometimes you watch back and like, my God, you know, the insights into this issue were so ahead of their time. He, Larry is so prescient about things. It's amazing. You know, whether it's, look, we did, we shot that episode with Bruce Springsteen where he has to cancel his tour because Larry gets the COVID. Two months later, he has to cancel, not because of COVID, but for something mm -hmm. else. It's like those things happen all the time. And it's kind of like woo-woo, like, whoa, how did he know that? <laughs> he's, he's got the, the magic ball somewhere, the crystal finger ball. On the, finger on the pulse. Yeah. Do, do you have uh, some comic influences? Like who Like who are your, uh, who, who inspired you as, as a well, up when I was Well, when I was growing up, um, Carol Burnett was a huge influence. I mean, now she didn't do stand-up. She did sketch stuff. But that's how I started. I started mm -hmm. doing all these characters when I first started doing stand-up in the early 80s. Um, so she was a huge influence. And what's interesting about watching the Carol Burnett show, uh, in retrospect, 
what I loved about it at the time was they always looked like they were having so much fun. You know, they'd break up. Harvey Corman would start laughing and Tim Conway. And, and that's kind of how we are on the curb set. We laugh all day. You could see Larry. You could see him stifling giggles in almost every take. We laugh all day long. So in a way, my, my life has become my fantasy. Uh, what, I, what I kind of thought that it would be like, is, which is a very lucky thing, I suppose. Also, um, Mel Brooks, that, that when I was five and that 2,000-year-old man album came out, I listened to that over and over on my little record player in my room. And I used to stand up on the kitchen table and do both parts, Carl and Mel, you know, and, and that the rhythm of that was such, was really the first comedic influence for me was the rhythm of that album. And years later, I would sometimes find myself on stage when I was doing stand up, and I would just hear myself doing the rhythms of, of them in, in a way that I was unconsciously that was just it was ingrained in my body so they were influences and you know all the all the great comics that came before me Pryor and Robert Klein and Joan and you know all of them you know I, I grew up watching is there one episode or one scene that stands out for you as, as your favorite or that there's so many stick? I mean in this past season that 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 scene on the stairwell where we're you're a virus screaming at each other has become one of my new favorites but I would have to say going back it would be the doll because that was season two and the driveway scene, um, that was really, that was the first time that that was, Susie Green was really, you know, we knew who she was from this point on. And I had my own spaghetti Western music theme song. That was the first time I had that. And um, it was the first time you really saw that Jeff and Larry live in fear of Susie, what the dynamic was. And then it continued for the next 11 seasons after that. So. And it's also the doll, well, there's so many that are, but the doll is an example of a perfect, perfectly crafted half hour of comedy. And anybody who wants to write comedy, I would say take apart that episode and study it. I'll go back and rewatch it. I, I mean, <laughs> there's so many, it's, it's every every season you're like, what are they gonna do next? And can they can they keep this going? And then every season it comes, it, it delivers, it, it's like, so I don't have favorite episodes. It's just like, yeah, me neither. it's just like, it's kind of like, it's a, it's really a comfort show because you can go into any episode and go, like, okay, let's hang out with this group of people and you know, you're going to have a good time and you know, and, you'll be on laugh. Exactly. Yeah. It's, and you know, it's one of the reasons, I mean, I get asked this so often, is it really the end? Cause you know, this is, we did the finale and I, I really believe it is because this season, season 12, I thought was fantastic. I love the finale. I loved how it ended. I love the whole season. And I feel like, go out that way you know it ne we never jumped the shark there was never a season that didn't work so let's go out on a high note it's been a really long time and um it's it's been for me it's been more than half of my uh professional life i've been doing this show and it has been the, the greatest privilege of my professional life that's wonderful wonderful to have something like that that you can you know what you're yeah you're content now so everything else is just yeah, uh, gravy. gravy is, yep. <laughs> is there a, a funniest moment that we never saw on the air? Just that you could share with me? Oh gosh, you know, there's so many. I mean, there. Larry won't let anybody put a blooper reel out, but if we did, there's so many moments where we're just, you know, hysterical laughing. Um, I, nothing comes to mind offhand. I, I I don't have that kind of memory. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. And what I was know, your last for me, oh, for me, Steve, uh, for me, the, 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 the moment that I laughed the most was in season eight. It was in Officer Krupke. It was when Larry was supposed to be wearing women's underwear. And because Jeff found a pair of women's, I found a pair of women's underwear in Jeff's glove compartment. Because, of course, he's cheating on me again. And Jeff tells me they're Larry's. So Larry has to be, for, and Larry drops his pants and he's wearing these little red bikini panties. I think I laughed more at that moment than I've ever laughed in my <laughs> life, looking at him in those in the women's underwear. Luckily, uh, for everyone, it wasn't CGI. We got to witness that. Exactly. In all, all its glory. This is why AI, nobody could take our jobs away. No, no. <laughs> uh, and, and what was the last day of shooting like for you? It was very emotional. It was extreme. Little did I know we were going to come back a year later and do a day of reshoots, but for the time being, Mm -hmm. they, it, it was the last scene. The last scene was the last scene on the plane. 
Um, I, I am thrilled that, that Richard was with us. Um, cause now, now I'll start to cry. Um, it was, uh, you know, it's funny. We shot the first scene of the episode on the plane. You know, you get a, a plane set, you shoot everything out of order because you're not going back to the plane set. That's just how mm -hmm. the magic of uh, film and television. And the first scene we shot on the plane, I don't even remember shooting that scene. And nobody else does either because we were all so in such a, a weird place in our heads knowing this is it. This is it. And, you know, plenty of times Larry would say, that's it. I'm not doing another season. And he always would. But we all knew that this was really it and that we were we're a family. I mean, we've been together for a really long time. And most of us have known each other from even before we started doing Curb. So it was uh, it was intense. And, and when we were finished, Richard gave a little speech and then Cheryl gave a little speech and then I was going to give a little speech, but I, I started crying. So I was like, let me just walk away. I can't, I, I was too emotional. And Larry, Larry was very quiet. So I knew that he was emotional because he's never quiet on set. He was very kind of just quiet, but he's not one to make speeches. Yeah. And to end off uh, some, this amazing piece of work, but also it's kind of like the time to stop and reflect at, at, well, now there's even more, but with Richard passing, but the people you've lost along the way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's 24 years is a long, is long for anything, yeah. anything at yeah. all. And, and especially and the, the, most, the, the most important, I don't want to say most important, that's wrong, but the major players of the show that we lost are, are Richard and Bobby on sign and Shelly Berman, mm -hmm. who are the most important characters on the show that, that are no longer with us. Um, it, all of you know, Bob's death was wrenching. Richard's death was, these are comedic voices that can't be replaced. They're so original. And, um, you know, Vince came in and Vince is brilliantly funny. And bro Vince is one of the greatest improvisers I've ever worked with. He truly is brilliant. And he, you know, play, playing Freddie Funkhauser. And that was a great addition, but it doesn't replace Bob. You know, no. Bob's gone. Bob can't be replaced. And it's it's been something that's been, it, we missed Bob. I remember after the season Bob died, I remember in the end uh, writing to Larry and saying, you know, I missed him more than I even thought I would. And I knew I'd miss him a lot. He agreed. We both missed him so much. And Lewis, Lewis and Larry were best friends. And I can't even, if, if there was ever any question that we were coming back after Lewis died, it was just, there's, there's no way we're coming back. There's no way. That was just a, a loss beyond anything. Yeah, that was that was tough. Just as a fan, you know, as a yeah. fan of his comedy for years, seeing him on like the Tonight Show and all, you know, yeah. and then into into uh, Kirby enthusiasm and, and it, everything else he's done. And then it's like, he was such an original, just a completely yeah. original comedic brain that that's gone, but he lives with us. And he was the nuttiest, most insane person I've ever known, in a good way. But he was out of his mind, and it was a joy to behold. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. I'm glad you had the time with him. That's and I'm glad that we had the time with him on, on the screen. Yeah. So let me close out with an easy one. Three words to describe Susie. Susie Green or Susie, Susie Green. Esmond? Susie Green. Green. Uh, oh, let's say um, brash. Word, but you can swear. <laughs> take no prisoners. <laughs> Yeah, that works. I like it. Well, thank you so much for your time uh, here today and for your work in the series. And I'm, I mean, I, I look back to watching it again. And if it ever happens that Larry says one more, I'm hoping that uh, everybody's in. We can. Yeah, trust me, we're there. Yeah, sounds great. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you so much. Steven. Have a Bye. great day. Bye now.